We're recording and we're broadcasting. We're now live on the internet. By the way, Leslie, you know how we do our numbers, multiply times a thousand, actually you divide by a thousand. So we've got 5,000 people live with us on this call right now. So, All right. That's yeah, awesome. it's pretty about cool. That. When I heard you say that before, I thought, good gracious, that's a lot of people. Well, now you know, I know for celebrities. Uh-huh. Well, was well, that a con confirmation uh-huh or a satirical <laughs> one? I actually had a few coworkers say, um, you're going to be on Teddy and Randy, uh, like I was a celebrity. And then they said, well, what are you going to talk about? Um, and sounded a little bit nervous about that. So. <laughs> yeah, I know your coworkers ignore all of them. I know. I pretty much do. <laughs> <laughs> all right. We're up to 14,000 people right now on Facebook. Oh my golly. 3,000 people on Facebook, Randy. Yeah, we're, uh, we're moving up. That's I pretty good before the hour is even started. Hey, Inez is on Facebook. Uh, any questions you guys have on Facebook, drop the questions in the chat and we'll answer them for you. We have experts that are participating with us today. We do. We, we do. Randy, we do. Yep. Yeah, we're, uh, <clears throat> I guess we're, we're, the clock on the wall says it's noon. So let's start. Yeah, yeah we should get, we should stop playing around. Hey, um, um, look, Chan knows how we play this. He's already jumping in. So, um, uh, I'm Teddy Burris, and this is my good friend, Mr. Randy Wooden. And in my picture here, I have our other good friend, Leslie Spees, joining us. You're at, you are participating in the uh, Randy Wooden and Teddy Burris lunch conversations. Uh, I'm, Randy, can I do the housekeeping? Please do. <laughs> Please do. You're doing. So, you're a housekeeper this week. You are I'm a housekeeper. Yeah, because this is because uh, this is Rand, this is Randy's invite. You're Randy. So hey, housekeeping is this. You have a question, you drop it in the chat box. If you drop a question in the chat box that's relevant to the conversation, then I will bring that up with our expert that we've invited to the show. Um, how about everybody who's on here? Because we're up to nineteen thousand people on here already. Um, how about drop it in the chat? I'll drop it in the chat. Where are you from? What city, state, country, mm -hmm. or planet are you from? Because we want to know. Where Italy was from? the farthest. It, Italy was the farthest so far. I think we had somebody from Italy. Yeah. So, um, yeah, not sure how that happened, but yeah. we're... <laughs> Well, you threw that bottle in the in the river, dude. I with did. The, with the URL in it, and apparently it drifted all the way over there. It did. Jessica, Greensboro's exciting. Yep. Don't say that. You know? So, anyway, yeah. cool. We're good to have everybody on here. Again, I'm Teddy Burris. Um, um, this is the Randy Wooden and Teddy Burris lunch discussion. We're still trying to figure out a couple things. What's the real name we want to use? You know, uh, we're looking for, uh, we're, we're, we're working through ideas on branding. There was a conversation earlier this morning that we may actually get some music. We might, we're thinking about soundtrack. So if you have an idea of a specific soundtrack that we should use, drop that in the chat as well. We'd love to hear your thoughts. And remember, Randy and I are sophisticated, so we don't want to hear ideas about meatloaf, okay? Um, so anyway, I'm Teddy. I'm a LinkedIn strategist. I, I have a, my own business teaching LinkedIn as a business tool. Uh, if you don't know who I am, you don't spend enough time on the internet. And uh, Randy, introduce yep. yourself and then introduce our guest. Yeah, thanks again, Randy Wooden with Goodwill's Professional Center here in Winston-Salem. We, uh, as you might expect, help professionals through their job search. We don't charge them. We don't charge companies. So if you're watching and you or maybe somebody you know that, that might be going through a transition, uh, Teddy and I both help you. We're both free. Uh, he does that as part of his, his overall thrilling lifestyle over there at the, at the big chair. Uh, and I do it as a full-time job. So uh, between the two of us and a few other folks in the area, we're all willing to, to try to help and, and get you where you need to go. So one of the fun things that we do, and it's informative as well, is what we do today, our lunchtime chat. We try to bring in a guest that has a perspective to help people through perhaps the job search specifically or some kind of professional development or also how to handle workplace scenarios once you are employed. And so my 
My good friend and, and our special guest today is Leslie Spees. She's the VP of Culture and what is the other one? Consulting, Consulting. at the resource. <laughs> Uh, and has an extensive background in HR. I've known you for a long time, and you've been very helpful at a lot of our uh, group chats that we've had with, with our professional center. So I'll turn it to you, Leslie, to, to introduce yourself and to talk about the topics, and then I'll, uh, I'll fire away with a few questions for you. Okay, great. Um, well, first of all, for the theme song, I vote for ACDC. I don't know why, but <laughs> why not? <laughs> Which one? <laughs> Okay, well, just to tell you a little bit about me, as Randy said, I work for The Resource. We are a career services and human capital solutions company. Uh, the title sounds a lot more exciting than what it is, the VP of Culture and Consulting. So what that means is I'm over HR for the organization. And then I also lead a uh, consulting services division. So um, just in a nutshell, some of the things that, that we do are HR outsourcing, um, and also assistance, turnover, retention, and engagement, counseling, training, development, and coaching for employees and leaders. We have a core assessment that we use for things like team building, uh, diversity, recruiting, do succession planning and some of the services like that, and then career and outplacement services. Um, wow. In addition, part, oh, go ahead, Randy. I was going to say, you're going to fit that on a business card? Or what? That's, <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> The resource is the resource to turn to if you have any That's or all right. of those concerns. Any, any people problems, yeah. call us. Sounds like it. Hit us so, up. so speaking of problems. Uh -huh. My wife has not called you, right, Leslie? Uh, not yet. Okay. <laughs> I don't know if I can help her. I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> hey, here's the deal, right? Leslie's here to talk about politics, religion, hot button controversial topics that may or may not come up during the interview. They may come up during the job search itself. They may pop up when you're employed and dealing with your coworkers. And so how do you handle those? How do you present yourself to others? How do you address those controversial topics if they come up in the interview or in the workplace? Obviously it's very timely given the election season and just our culture in general. So a lot of I guess controversy swirling around here. And the, 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 the beauty with having Leslie here is that you have an HR background. And so you not only understand the, the, the laws and, and what's appropriate and what isn't, but you also live your faith and, and actually have a book coming out, Hot Mess to Message, and the mess in message is, is all capped. And so you blogged for quite some time now about the challenges that a Christian faces in their everyday lives and also how that relates to their work lives. And so that's kind of setting up what we'll talk about today. If you have questions, go ahead and chat those in because I'm sure at some point, if you live long enough, you're going to run into this topic and mm -hmm. it would be nice to have a little bit of knowledge about how to handle it. So first off, Leslie, first question, what are some laws that are out there that uh, around religion or, or politics in the workplace, and what impact does that have on, on me as, as a candidate as I'm interviewing? Okay, great question. Um, so one of the biggies is Title VII of the Civil Rights Act. So that um, prohibits discrimination or harassment in any term or condition of employment for religion, and also some other categories, race, sex, national origin, and color are covered under that law. Um, it, as I said, any term and condition of employment, so that's everything from the recruiting process to compensation to training to promotions to terminations. So it covers every level. And as far as religion goes, um, it also requires employers to at least consider a reasonable accommodation uh, to accommodate employees' religious beliefs. Um, so in one of my former employers, just to kind of tell a little bit of a story about this, we had 20 different cultures. Um, and with different cultures, there's a lot of different practices, and those include religious practices. So lots of experience in the accommodating religious practices uh, realm, if anybody needs that. Um, but as it relates to Title VII, as I said, it's any part of the employment process, so that includes recruiting. Uh, however, as an applicant, um, it's pretty hard to 
prove any kind of discrimination based on religion because chances are you're probably just not going to get a call um, if somebody's basing a judgment on your resume or it's early in the process. Um, if you're employed somewhere, then, you know, maybe a little bit easier to make a case for that. Uh, yes, Teddy, go ahead. So, um, remember folks, we want to make these questions predominantly about job search. How does, how do these, how do we navigate these conversations and how do we make sure that, uh, uh, that, that we're being engaged with and with, with recruiters and hiring managers in the right context of, you know, in, in, in this area of, you know, these conversations, these issue points. But Denise did ask a question that it might be worth asking that's somewhat relevant. And that is, is this still, well, she asks, is it politically correct? So I don't know if that's really a, a, a the most important way to ask it in regards to Christmas parties versus holiday parties. Maybe it's not politically correct to have a Christmas party when you have 20 different cultures in an organization. Mm -hmm. um, but is it against the law? No, it's not against the law. And I have seen a lot of organizations um, switch their terminology to holiday instead of Christmas because we do want to accommodate, you know, all religious yeah. differences yeah. within the workplace. So that's the reason for that. But there are some organizations that are Christian based and um, outwardly express their Christian values. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah so so you've, you've talked about the laws that deal with discrimination. Now, does the, does that extend to political views as well? Or because I didn't think I heard political views. I did not talk about that. So political views are not covered under any particular law. Okay. In an interview, um, you know, for the most part, employers should be asking job related questions. So you probably won't be asked and it probably wouldn't be too politically correct to ask a question about your political affiliation, but there's no law that prohibits that. Does now that I can sense? see as a recruiter trying to uh, measure for fit, cultural fit. Mm -hmm. where now I, I, I got to be careful, but this is a thought in my mind. And I know, Randy, you got to be careful of all that. Whew. But <laughs> could there be some value as a recruiter to ask? Tell me your opinion of the current political uh, debates going on. Tell me your opinion of the current, you know, uh, uh, presidential elections. And the reason I think that question might be useful is to see how much that individual will flare up mm -hmm. or control. What do you think, Leslie? Um, I think, I mean, I, as an interviewer, I have always tried to stick to the job related questions. So I would not go there and don't really feel like that should be part of the process of assessing a candidate. Interesting. So um, so, I, and I get that. And, and I also get that in particularly in larger or even mid-sized companies that actually have an HR department that they're schooled, the HR folks are schooled in saying, look, you can't ask certain people certain questions and not ask those of others. You need to mm -hmm. treat right. each interview the same. That said, small time entrepreneur, fly by the seat of their pants, you know, that kind of thing, uh, the, the filter that they have may not be thick enough. <laughs> so, so those questions may come up, mm -hmm. put you on the spot. Could you give some guidance as to how you as the candidate, when you're blindsided by something like that, what would a typical response or a deflection sound like? Well, I'll tell you what, what I would say is probably that, you know, I know it's a hot topic and kind of a polarizing issue right now. I prefer not to really um, get into that uh, in the interview, if it's okay with them. Mm -hmm. And, you know, maybe the, let the chips fall where they may. I mean, mm -hmm. if, if, if that's the Might style of interview, but, that, yeah. Either way, you run some risk. So. <laughs> Well, yeah, and and certainly can understand that. All right, so there's a bit of a difference here. I'm gonna I'm gonna draw a line of distinction somewhat between what I'll call the job search and the face-to-face -face or over-the-phone interview. Mm -hmm. And as you're conducting a search, 
and let's say you're doing informational interviewing, you're networking, you're talking to guys like Teddy or me or, or whomever. And is that, is, is politics, religion, anything like that part of that discussion at all in your mind? Um, I would say that I probably would minimize it mm -hmm. as part of that discussion. Um, and for some folks, I'm sure we'll get into this in the discussion, but you know, there are some folks that part of their work experience includes working for a church or maybe even being a pastor. Uh, and if you have those experiences, obviously you need to share those on a resume and as you're talking to folks, but I think focusing on accomplishments and transferable skills is going to be important. There was an interesting question, Teddy. I see. Yeah, uh, John poses the question. Uh, it's not a question as much as an observation. And it, he said a couple of weeks ago, he saw a job ad that specified they would only consider people who supported social justice causes. I don't recall the wording, but that was the gist of it. Hmm. Is that, uh, are you seeing more of that? I guess that's one thing to, to ask you. Are you seeing more of, of that in, in the job ads out there on the internet? I have not seen that. I can't say that I'm totally surprised with everything that's going on in, in the world today, but I've not seen that. So with the all, with the, um, uh, we have friends in the triad, which is Winston-Salem, North Carolina area, that um, have businesses that are focused on what's referred to as corporate social responsibility. Mm -hmm. And it, um, and I hate saying that it's this, you know, growing. And I want, and I, and I'm, I'm going to use this word, but it's not the word I want to use. It's growing fad, but it's not a fad. It's a growing awareness. That's the right word. Mm -hmm. A growing awareness of it being important for organizations to encourage their employees to be involved in some level of social responsibility, and mm -hmm. towards that end, uh, uh, incur uh, wanting people who are who are support and participate in some way or another, or at least support social justice. I think that's gonna be a growing um, in awareness for individuals to, to consider when they're applying for jobs. Sure, and I see a little bit of difference in the terms um, social responsibility. I have seen that. I haven't seen it worded as social justice, and I think there is probably a distinction. There is, there is, but I think that there's also relevance. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, and, and one of the thing uh, is we had talked off camera here uh, before we we came on, and, and today's topic is not even though we, we're talking politics, religion, this is not gonna get into bashing one side or the other. So it, just keep that in mind. What we're trying, well, I know, Teddy. <laughs> <laughs> I know. But I mean, you can go on Facebook and find that to your heart's content. You can go on any social media, you're gonna find that. What we're really trying to do is to, is to give you some tools and maybe some, some guidelines yeah. as to how to conduct yourself yeah. during the process of the search of the interview and when you're face to face, because in a professional environment, hey, there's work to be done. And so how do we either deal with, deflect, uh, that kind of thing, and that's really the, the focus for today. So, all right, so lots of stuff to, to think about. So we don't talk about, or you minimize the politics, religion, when you're just networking with people, you're talking with them, minimize that. Uh, okay, so let's switch gears a little bit. You mentioned earlier, somebody may have been employed at a church or may have served on a board of trustees at a church or have been an elder or a deacon or, you know, and, boy. well, there's that. And, and, and I've had a number of clients who have been in the ministry mm -hmm. and are looking to make a transition. And so for, for people whose job or who had a very intense uh, volunteer experience is that something that should go on a resume? If so, how do you depict it? Where do you put it on the resume? How, how do you showcase that, if at all? Mm -hmm. I think if, if it's work experience, you really need to put it on the resume. Um, again, I would focus on the accomplishments and transferable skills that came out of that. And you may consider in determining the format of your resume. Uh, it may be that you wanna do a combo or a, uh, I'm not wild about them, but a functional resume um, for that purpose. Um, is if it's volunteer work, I think it's kind of your call. I mean, it's on my resume, 
because I feel like it's meaningful and that I've, you know, gleaned good things from that experience. Um, but it is your call as to whether you put it on there or not. Um, there is a thing, I know you had a topic, I think you mentioned on diversity a few weeks ago. Um, as people are looking at your resume, there is a thing called unconscious or implicit bias. And what that means is that people may not even realize it, but um, they may make a judgment about you based on a particular category because it's on your resume. So you always run the risk of that being the case. Um, now, if it's kind of switch gears from the uh, religious aspect, say you volunteer to help uh, pair LGBT teens with a uh, mentor and you're debating on whether you want to put that on your resume or not. Um, it may be that you can't even fathom the thought of working for an organization that would uh, make a judgment based on that. And if that's the case, by all means, put it on there. But you do run the risk with any of those things that may be controversial um, with that un unconscious bias. Hopefully you won't have conscious bias, but that comes into play sometimes too. Yeah. I often say, Leslie, that in this same context, that this applies to your LinkedIn profile as well. Mm -hmm. Your LinkedIn profile is a public document. So mm -hmm. you should never put anything on there that you are concern would create this, uh, you know, the subconscious thought or you know, uh, uh, this implicit bias from others that they don't want to have a conversation with you to get to know who you are relevant to their needs. Now, mm -hmm. once Leslie and I sit and talk and we get to know each other, I'll peel back whatever layers are relevant and tell you about my religious experiences, my political experiences, again, in a conversation with someone who's wanting to learn more about me, but not on a public document. Right. Yeah, and we'll get we'll get into a lot more uh, detail I think coming up here on talking about social media because that's huge and it's it, I mean everybody's on it to some degree or you've certainly been exposed to it in the workplace so there's there's all that. What are some other tips I guess you could think of if any that deal with the job search and dealing with the whole politics religion that topic and then once we get past that, then we'll maybe look at the interview itself in a little more detail too. Okay, sure. Yeah. Um, actually, I read about a study uh, in preparation for this. The University of Connecticut did a study. Wow, she prepared. <laughs> Aren't y'all impressed? They found that employers awesome. are less likely to hire job applicants with an overt religious identity. So some statistics with that. Um, these candidates got 24% fewer email responses and 33% fewer calls. Um, and then also on the, on the political side, um, they found, it was a different study, but they found that, um, you know, that they were, people were less likely to trust candidates if their political affiliation was contrary to what that person believed, which kind of makes sense. So you do run the risk of those things coming into play. And I, I wonder just how prevalent that is, because that's something that we talk about the, the bias, uh, unconscious bias. And, and I know uh, Val had talked about that uh, a few weeks ago with the diversity issue. Uh -huh. We're all human. And we've had interaction with people that, that are like us and people who aren't like us. And whether yeah. that's race, gender, religion, politics, you name it. It's a big world. And so part of the getting along and understanding each other, I think has value, but here again, a lot of that takes time, meaning, okay, I'm working with Teddy and I get to know him, but if it's a, the first date, basically it's the interview, how do I put on the game face now so that I can, I can win so that I can, I can get the job. You covered, a, I, I think what I mainly wanted to ask, which is don't bring it up. And if they bring it, meaning politics, religion, then you deflect. Am I hearing you right? So deflect, and and that's you know that's that's something that. Uh, how, how did you phrase that again? How did you phrase that? Somebody says, "How do you feel about the election? How do you feel about our president? How do you feel about this? Whatever." Yeah, I'd probably just say something like, you know, I realize that it's a very um, hot topic right now. I'd probably prefer not to share my personal beliefs in this forum something mm -hmm. like that okay and uh would somebody have heartburn with that do you think they, they would say well they might. If, why, if, why should that be a problem i just a simple question 
if they did, it probably answered a question. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, but yeah, how did, how how would they? Well, okay, well, if you really want to know, <laughs> <laughs> you ask for it. Um, but chances are, you know, the interview is kind of a two-way assessment. If somebody went down that road with me, it's probably not an organization that I want to work for. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And what are, uh, other than the obvious cues, maybe uh, a sign behind the, the person's desk about, you know, maybe they're accepting or a handshake with a certain candidate or whatever. What are some cues that you, as the interviewee, might pick up on as you're interviewing with somebody or maybe getting a tour of their facility or talking with some of their current employees? Are there certain signals that say this could be kind of dicey if I, if I go here? Are there things you look for? Intuitive things, maybe? That's a great question. I think I just kind of would assess the whole environment. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if they had a, a giant uh, Trump sign and I don't like Trump, that might color my, <laughs> my view. Not yeah. saying that I don't, but uh, I think you just, I don't know that there's anything specific. Obviously, if somebody had something discriminatory or, you know, contrary to your belief sitting around their office, that would be a red flag. I yeah. have, um, uh, clients who are in the religi religious industry, interesting enough, in lots of different religions. And, um, and I, every now and then, get a client who, um, one client before we start work, another client after the session is done. These are today virtual sessions, but I've had it in real life as well, where they want to say a prayer. Mm -hmm. And um, and now for me, Teddy, I'm ex I don't want to, I won't use the word tolerant, I'm accepting of that. But as, mm -hmm. as the service provider or the candidate, I don't know that I'd walk into a meeting and say, may I say a prayer first? Mm -hmm. I think I would be in my car and say my prayer before I got started. Right. Um, but but we, we're, we're going to get that. I think more the more um, uh, we are uh, accepting of culture, we're going to get those situations where we work with people who want to you know, acknowledge their faith openly mm -hmm. uh, in the workspace, you know, so that we're going to have more of these conversations, I think. What do you think? Mm -hmm. I do. Hey, Leslie, I want to ask you on a more of a personal note and we'll, we'll, I, cause I want to save the social media piece for a while. Cause that we could spend <laughs> yeah. the day yep. debating the world's issues uh, that appear before our very eyes. I'm school. ready, Randy scrolling fashion uh, every day and Leslie you and I are and, and Teddy the three of us are peas in a pod in terms of our humor um, I, <laughs> some of the stuff we enjoy is 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 fairly that's random tough. it's nothing that's going to get us fired at mm -hmm. least I hope not but um, <laughs> but well, it, I'm going to show you my hat oh, no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> so. We all wore hats in one of our recent Zoom staff meetings, uh, so I'm not the most appropriate of the HR people, but anyhow. All right. Go right ahead. <laughs> now, now you made me you made me forget the question, but no, I want to ask you on a, on a personal, actually, we're, all, we're almost halfway through the show, so we always like to reintroduce our, our guests and to encourage more uh, folks to chat in with some questions, but Leslie Spees has joined us with a resource. VP of Culture and Consulting with the resource. Long background in human resources. And you are the author of a book that's due out. Tell us about that. I am. Um, so my book is called Confessions of a Hot Mess, From Mess to Message. Uh, and really what I just kind of felt called to write. I've always liked to write and have done it, you know, as part of my work, but never thought that I would write a book or anything like that. But as I started, I didn't really know how to start. So I started blogging and I blogged about the issues that I experience. And I have so many issues that it got up to 90 days. So I put it in a book. <laughs> you got issues, woman, I'm telling you. I know. Yeah. So when so it, when I sent it out to some publishers and I got an offer to publish. So 
Um, I actually have written a second book, which I have, um, uh, my, my first book, the hot mess book is, it was due out this fall, but with COVID, they've pushed it back to the spring. Um, but I've written a book, Navigating the Workplace for Christians. And uh, I did that because I have struggled in several of the workplaces where I've been with maintaining my Christian values and navigating politics and all of those type things. So um, I decided it might be a topic that would be of interest to some folks. And right now I do have an um, offer from a hybrid type publisher where you finance part of it to publish, but um, I'm, I'm waiting to hear from some others. So hopefully that will go somewhere. Well, could you, without giving it all away, but could you share anecdotally some of the challenges that you've run into trying yeah, to, to walk the talk in, in your day-to-day -day life as an employee somewhere? Mm -hmm. What are some challenges? Uh, well, some of the things that, I, as I mentioned, maintaining my Christian values. So sometimes um, I don't have a lot of tolerance if people don't display integrity. And that is not always the case in some organizations. I also have struggled a lot with uh, backstabbing in politics. Um, I don't have a lot of tolerance for that. So, you know, that's been an issue. Um, so in my book, I really kind of go into everything from values to dealing with change to diversity and inclusion. And then, you know, several times in my life, uh, like maybe some of the folks on the call, I have found myself downsized and uh, I've even got a chapter on, on dealing with that and the emotions that you go through and um, how to find your next position. So a lot, lots of good. And is that in the hot mess one that comes out or is that in there's the- a few, There's a few work related things in, in the hot mess and those 90 days of issues. <laughs> but more of them are things like people pleasing and comparison and things like that. Very good. Uh, again, or just a reminder, if you have questions for Leslie, please chat those in. And our yeah. housekeeper at the, uh, at the switch is Dr. Burris. And uh, he will be, uh, he's not really a doctor. I just, I just call him that. You're not, are you? Or ha ha Man, I, I got a stethoscope somewhere in the house. I got a, a, a blood pressure cuff. Does that make me a doctor? I got a, I got a thermometer over there. I, I haven't figured out how to use it yet. So, I mean, I just... I'll get it figured out, but uh, anyway, now we uh, we appreciate you coming on, Leslie. So let me let me approach that next topic, which could take a little bit, and that deals with social media. Now you're you're on the HR side of the, the house, and so you have done your fair share of recruiting, mm -hmm. and so we want to kind of bookmark that. Meaning, what are some things you look for or red flags? Um, mm -hmm. What are things that current employees should avoid? That's another topic we can cover. Okay. Um, how we interact with people. I know, Teddy, you preach this all the time. You know, do, do the stuff that you do on social media like you would be doing it if you were face to face and how you want to be seen. Mm -hmm. And they're all, that's great advice. So I don't know where we want to start. Okay. But why don't you, you, you <laughs> run with it, Leslie? But that's a big Pandora's box I just opened. And, and uh, all right. Well, if I get off track, just give yeah. me back. But let me. First, I have the mute button, have, Leslie. You know, that's right, he does. So I have the mute button. Pay attention. Okay. okay. Uh, well, I'll, first I'll start by saying that, you know, personally, if you look at my social media, you'll find that I like coffee, puppies, wine, and Jesus, and not in that particular order. <laughs> so I'm not the best model, but uh, I, I will first say that as an, as an employer, as a recruiter, um, yeah, most of them look at social media sites, and that includes your personal social media sites. I think the last statistic I looked at from Career Builder was about 70%. Mm -hmm. um, so obviously your LinkedIn is, uh, needs to be business related. Um, I would not go into some of the topics that we've talked about on, on LinkedIn. Um, probably would not go into a lot of humor and things like that, Randy. <laughs> Just kidding. Randy does a lot on his personal Facebook. He's very funny. But <laughs> anyhow, so would you guys agree from a LinkedIn standpoint, keep it professional? Yeah, I'm, I'm a huge fan of, um, of keep it professional. 
but I think you got to peel back the layer a little bit, let people know who you are a little bit mm -hmm. uh, as a human, but you're right. Uh, you know, the pun jokes that we share on Facebook do not belong on LinkedIn. Um, <laughs> they just don't, but, 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 you know, Leslie, I, you know, as a recruiter, you know, I would think that you want to know a little bit more about that human. And so mm -hmm. when you see a little bit about that human on LinkedIn, it, it makes you feel better that you're talking to a human and not a robot. Yeah. Well, and that's why we look on some of the other sites as well, because you want to be able to get a little insight into the person. Um, and you guys, hopefully, now I know that you guys know this, but some people may not. You know, if you have a Facebook profile and you don't set do your settings as private, then anybody can really go and look at it and see what you post. So, and I think it's probably the same. I don't use Instagram and some of the others, but I think it's probably the same. Um, so I would be very cautious about posting, you know, pictures of myself partying or protesting or, you know, at the Trump rally or at the Biden rally or, you know, whatever, because those things are going to become data points um, for that recruiter. Now, if you want to post those things, then fine, I'd make your profile private. Randy mentioned, you know, as a current employee, how does that apply? Um, and it is part of your brand. So even if you have your settings private, if you're friends with people at work, they're going to see that information and it may impact, you know, how you're seen at work and future promotions and things like that. And some of it may be based on that unconscious bias that we talked about. Yeah. Interesting. So uh, my words of wisdom, which uh, again, do as I say, not as I do, uh, <laughs> but, but those are when in doubt, leave it out. Yeah. Yeah. Out, leave it out. I think that's and good. I, I think, and, and I've I've seen times where a post magically has disappeared. Somebody's mm -hmm. post that was pretty inflammatory, mm -hmm. and it may be that they just sobered up the next day. I mean, that could be that could be honestly part of it. Yeah. But I think sometimes we get, and I, I don't know if if there's probably some kind of chemical reaction that goes on when you know you engage in this debate and you're not face to face it's a, it's a lot harder to call somebody a jerk or an idiot or an ignoramus if i'm face to face with you because frankly teddy will beat the crap out of me right but it's easier for me to sit here online and do it and now i feel emboldened um and maybe then i regret that uh so it went in doubt leave it out sometimes just kind of take a walk around that'd be my advice take a walk around the, the man cave i'd go from the east wing to the west wing and and, and maybe I come back and I go, you know, that's not worth it. Uh, is, that, is that really a mountain or a hill you want to die on, so to speak? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we've had employees that, uh, you know, through goodwill, um, who have posted, uh, you know, bad things about their, their boss or their employer. And I mean, that's just not cool. And very often are um, not just simply called in to try to explain it, but are terminated when you get into some, some pretty inflammatory things and act accusation. So when in doubt, leave it out. Um, but the, the politics, the religion, much like with the job search, avoid those, it sounds like you're, you're saying on social media, certainly from a public standpoint. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And, and the religion, I mean, I know that I personally, uh, yeah. that would not bother me. I mean, I blog, so it's going to have to be a part of my persona online because that's what I blog about. But, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, when in doubt, leave it out is probably a good philosophy. Yeah, I have an edict that I follow that's built upon lots of other quotes, such as when in doubt, leave it out. And that edict is never do, say, or engage. Never do, say, or engage on social media in any way you don't want to be seen, heard, or perceived of in life. Mm -hmm. Um, and that, that uh, I'm not saying that saved me every time because sometimes I forget the stuff that I know I'm supposed to pay attention to, mm -hmm. but it's important. And, um, uh, and I'm with you, Leslie. Um, um, and I don't, I don't share my uh, religious beliefs as much on social media as others do, but I'm, I, I, I'm a fan of those who politely, appropriately, uh, share their thoughts and their views and religious perspectives. And I would almost be willing to say in a political perspective, but it's so hard for people to do that. Um, 
you know, you know, you should you should show your faith where rel where relevant and appropriate is my point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I looked at another survey, so let me share this. This one's on politics. <laughs> Aren't y'all impressed? I am. So a study by Sherm, and it kind of gets off the social media topic, but a study by Sherm said that half of employees have been involved in or witnessed uh, political conversations at work, and that out of those, 78% felt disrespected um, or even bullied by a coworker based on that. So I see that increasing. And I know those of us that are on social media, you're seeing more and more and more of that as the election gets closer and heats up. So, all right, got a question for you now. Okay, so before I forget, politics is not covered as far as discrimination during the interview process mm -hmm. as as religion and, and race, gender, and so forth. Okay, right. so when you get into harassment in the workplace, you, you talked about bullying, mm -hmm. which to me falls under harassment. Um, my understanding from a layman's standpoint is that if it's pervasive, it is, so it's not a one-time thing, but if it's something that continues and it makes you feel, um, awkward or whatever, then that would fall under the harassment umbrella. Yeah. Yeah. Great point. I but, actually did a but, class. If, but if the harassment is about politics, which is not covered under the discrimination, does mm -hmm. it still violate? harassment law. Mm -hmm. um, it does not violate harassment law. However, most organizations have rules of conduct and values and, you know, standards of appropriate behavior. So as an employer, if somebody was bullying based on a category outside of those that are protected, that's probably, I would address the issue uh, using one of those methods. And would, what, and again, this is hypothetical, I'm asking for a friend, right? How, how often is she seen? <laughs> hypothetical? But I mean, who do you go to? You go, do you go to the person who's offending you? Do you go to HR? Do you go to your boss? When, if that's happening to you and you feel like it's real to you, mm -hmm. what steps should you take in and what order typically should you take those? Yeah, I would always recommend going directly to the person that you have the issue with whenever you can and whenever you feel comfortable with that. Um, but I know that, it, that there are times when you don't. So if that's the case, then I would go to your manager or HR. But mm -hmm. anytime that you can resolve an issue with the other employee involved, uh, I think that's best for the relationship and um, the best way to go with it. Yeah, I, I would agree. And, and, and those are sometimes pretty difficult discussions to have. Yeah. Um, do you have any any tips for how you might phrase it when you talk to the person who has been, I'll use the word offending you, any tips for how you want to approach that topic, any phrasing that you think might be useful to use in that situation? Yeah, well, I always use kind of a, it's a four-step model for giving feedback and it helps with difficult conversations. So first of all, you describe the behavior um, you use I statements uh, rather than saying, you know, you always do this, don't use absolutes. And then you describe the impact of the behavior. So, you know, when you said that, I felt um, dismissed or what, you know, whatever it may be. And then you ask the person for their feedback and then determine kind of next steps. So that's the, the model that I use. And there's a lot more to that. There's a, actually a whole class I could do on that, but that, that kind of helps me um, to plan out the conversation in advance. Not that you're going to have those notes right in front of you, mm -hmm. but anytime you can plan in advance what you're going to say, I think the conversation is going to go better. Hold that thought. And hold that thought because if somebody is watching this and they were trying to write that down, mm -hmm. and they were scurrying to get a pen handy, yeah. I'd like you to repeat those steps now, okay. if you don't mind. Sure. Uh, describe the behavior. Describe the impact of the behavior. Ask use, for uh, you said I, right? You use use the I statements. Yeah, using yeah. I statements instead of you statements. And focusing on the behavior and not the person. So a couple tips on that one. Describe the impact of the behavior. Ask for the other person's input because there may be something you don't understand about the situation that they can help clarify and then determine next steps. 
collaboratively it, with the other person. That sounds like uh, DDI consulting work. Where'd you, where'd you build that model from? Um, I actually got that from back in the day when I worked for Novant. Okay. Uh, but there are a lot of similar models. Yeah, yeah. Um, there's, uh, you know, S situation behavior impact is mm -hmm. one I think that CCL has. Yeah. Um, I like this four step model because it actually encourages that dialogue in yeah. between. Yeah. So, I'm with you. I think that, I think we often, we run to our uh, saviors. Uh, and I'm saying that word very human, humanistically. We run to HR before we even try to have a conversation. And the, the tagline for my business is it all starts with a conversation. Mm -hmm. I don't care what it is. We're trying to resolve something, We're trying to resolve, you know, um, workplace challenges, then we've got to be willing to get in a conversation and, and using these types of structures of our conversations can be very, can be very beneficial in achieving those goals. So yeah, thanks for sharing that. Randy. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, we've got oh, about 15 minutes left. And so we're kind of reaching that, reaching that point where we kind of want to wrap this up and, and what are some main takeaways, Leslie, that we can, we can try to implement it for a job hunter. Some of us watching are employed and just are curious about what you had to say, but yet we don't live in a bubble and mm -hmm. we interact with people, whether it's virtually like we are or on the phone or in person. So uh, mm -hmm. if you had to kind of summarize our topic today, how would you do that? What are some takeaways? Okay. Well, I think, uh, you know, kind of the takeaways are I would probably minimize some of the controversial topics on your resume and your social media and as you interview. Um, however, if it's something that's extremely important to you, if, um, you know, your Christian faith is extremely important to you and you want to work for an organization that um, definitely would support that and has Christian values, then by all means, it's your call and put it on there. Um, but in most cases, you know, I'd try, I'd really focus on if you do put it on there, what were your accomplishments, what are the transferable skills, um, and things that you can bring to an employer based on that experience. And with the election coming up, I'd say you minim minimize your um, political views at work if you can, if you can control yourself. Um, and on your social media and, and definitely on your resume. Now, if you're an event planner for the Democratic Party, you got to put it on your resume, but you know what I mean? Because it is such a polarizing topic, uh, you could probably turn somebody off real quick if, if they have the opposite uh, view of what you do. Yeah, and then you can run into trouble with that. Um, and I've seen, I have seen, um, and I won't get into a ton of detail, but little innuendo things on a resume that are dropped toward the bottom. For example, they were in a certain club in college or something like that. So a certain social club or you know, sort of a wink wink that's buried down there. But if you dig deep enough, you're going to be able to determine their politics, their race, their religion and so forth. Yeah. And, uh, and so it, it's a calculated risk, I think is what you're saying. You need yeah. to, if you put it on there, uh, try to make it as businessy is that a good word? Businessy? Yeah, I'm good with it. For me. Make, make it as business relevant as you can to talk about accomplishments, achievements, transferable skills, that kind of a thing versus saying, hey, I go to church. I'm a great guy. Mm -hmm. um, and, and while you may be a great guy, you know, we're not going to hire a bad guy. So, OK, so what is it about your other activities that tell me you can do the work and do it well? Mm -hmm. uh, so, Leslie, thank you for joining us. I hope you'll stick around for the rest of the show. Uh, I know Teddy and I usually like to wrap up with either some tips or observations or, or our takeaways. We also like to uh, mention who's coming up next week. Who is coming up next, Randy? Clemson Turagano and Melvin Scales. What's the topic? It, well, I'm glad you asked. <laughs> they're they're going to talk about executive presence and the language of leadership. Hmm. If you are a leader, or you aspire to move into a leadership role, it's, a, I don't want to say a different language, but I'll, I'll go with that. It's a different language and how you present yourself, not just in person, but to Leslie's point, on, in social media. 
And, and what, how do you package yourself as an effective leader? And so both these fellows have, have dealt with that from a coaching standpoint. They're both uh, friends of mine and, and I would say excellent leaders and I respect both of them very highly. And so we're really happy to, I know I am and I, Teddy, I'll speak for you. Happy to have both of them on next week. Uh, so for sure, you don't want to miss that. If, uh, if you know somebody that might be of interest as a topic, a topic, a person, be sure to let us know. So Teddy, let me throw it to you yeah, and then I I'll a, uh, wrap it up. I got a story I want to share, buddy. Yeah, man. Um, uh, first of all, um, appreciate everybody showing up. Leslie, thanks a lot for coming. Please tell your cohorts I said hello. I will do that. You can say, you can say it to them any way you want. Um, <laughs> Um, but we do appreciate the fact that Randy and I are, all we are is a, is a, a venue to bring smart people with good conversations. So we're, we're blessed that that happened. So, uh, and by the way, I'll share with you that in a previous life, I may not have said that I'm blessed to have had that happen, but for me, it's, it's who I am. And I, I'm, I'm happy to use those kinds of words appropriately and relevantly in the right conversation. So, um, uh, Randy fish bowls, buddy. Let's talk about fish bowls. You ready? Right. Okay. I don't have one handy, so you'll have to go without it. Uh, I don't either. So right. it's really, it's really the water you swim in. It's really about the water. The story turned into the water we swim in. And you know, the, the reality is we are in complete control of the quality of the water that we swim in. Nobody else is responsible for the environment that we put ourselves in. And you have to think about this in job search. You got to think about it in your decisions about where to go to work, the kind of people you want to work in the, with, the cultures that you want to work with, the words that people use around us. If you think about our environment as a fishbowl and the water that we're in, we have the greatest impact on the quality of that water. We can let it become a cesspool by encouraging, tolerating, giving the benefit of the doubt to people who swim in our water and letting them infest our water with their thoughts, their words, their ideas. Or we can make a decision about how we manage the quality of the water we swim in by managing the people, the networks, the conversations, the, um, you know, the activities that we participate in that could pollute our water. And furthermore, it's also to, important to remember, you can't look at your water and go, I don't like it today and dump it out and put in a whole new fresh source of water that can't happen first of all a fish would die if you dump out its water and put all new fresh water in i, I don't know if i completely agree with that because my wife's cleaned out enough fish bowls i've seen it happen but think about it from the context of you you can't move yourself from this environment to a whole new environment over over day overnight You've got to make changes. You've got to keep making adjustments. And you've also got to keep measuring with your pH meter of life and ask yourself, is this environment, is this water I'm swimming in what I want to swim in? And so think about that in the context of the people you hang out with and how do they impact your life in a positive way or a negative way. And you make decisions yourself about how clean to keep your water. That's my story, Randy. <laughs> Did you used to work in a pet store? <laughs> I was wondering. Because, uh, you know, I've killed many a fish in, in, my, in my life. And, uh, you know, I, I agree. You got to watch the water that, that they swim in and, and metaphorically the water that, that we swim in. Yeah. So um, yeah. I'm going to share, share a story. The true story has happened. And, and I think, like a lot of us, we're a product of, of what we've experienced, what we read, what we witness, what we watch, you know, TV or on social media and whatever. And I go back. I think I had hair back. This is a long time ago. I was in Ohio and I was trying to transition away from radio. I used to work at uh, some radio stations and, and the kids were young. And so I was trying to make a career change. And I interviewed with the state of Ohio uh, for a position in the communications department with 
get this, the Department of Liquor Control. Just, just saying. So anyways. Liquor or litter? Liquor with a Q. Okay. With a Q. They had a, and they may, I don't know if they still have it or not, but uh, back in the day, they had a Department of Liquor Control. And, uh, <laughs> and Did you I was, misinterpret the job description, Randy? <laughs> where's the liquor? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. So uh, I think that was the department. And uh, I may be wrong because I interviewed two or three times with the state. But anyway, so here I am, this young guy sitting across the table from the director of communications or whomever with whatever the department was. And uh, kids were young at the time. We had twin sons and I'm guessing they were, this would have been 91 or so. So they were probably three or four years old at the time. And uh, I'll, I'll never forget this, but I, so I'm sitting there and <clears throat> the guy asked me, he says, so, uh, so what do you do in your spare time? And I said, well, uh, I said, we, we have young children. <laughs> I'm glad you went that way. I was thinking you were going to go another way. Uh-uh. No, no, no. Uh, he, I, I said, uh, we have young children, so obviously with, with twin sons, there's a lot to keep us busy. But I said, I'm also very involved in our, in our local church, and I'm a, a deacon. And, and you know what? This guy's face went like this. <laughs> and right then and there, I knew that I wasn't going to get the job regardless of I, – I knew the interview was over because I told him that I was active in our church. Now – you know, here we're in North Carolina, so maybe faith is a bit more acceptable here, but Ohio's not that far away. It's not like New England where I grew up, all right? So there it's very compartmentalized, but uh, I'll always remember that. And I thought, wow, I just got dinged here for something wholly unrelated to anything that I do on the job. And, I, and maybe I shouldn't have said it at the time, but I said, hey, look, I'm not gonna sit here and pop a Bible open on my desk and preach to everybody that walks by. What I was trying to do is to show them that it's part of my life, but it's not going to be a negative impact for coworkers or for you. And you needn't basically just quit asking about it, basically. So I lost, I didn't get the job. And I've always remembered that. And, and, and I've, I've interacted with people, uh, to your point, Leslie, about the uh, unconscious bias and people who are adamantly anti-faith, not just keep it quiet. They're like, no, you're, you're a fool. You're an idiot clearly that was what I was inferring from what they were saying. And I have to fight that throughout my life, that bias that says this person doesn't think like I do. And depending on what side of the fence you're on, I think that's, it's a real thing. And I think it's something in, in now certainly with the social issues being in the news about unconscious bias, something that, that, that Val brought up a couple, three weeks ago. I think we all have to be aware that sometimes our experiences, they do shape how we are, but that not everybody is like that. And so for us, I think we've got to look at it at more of a case by case basis, but I've surely tried over the years uh, when I coach clients to, to do what you say, Leslie, about kind of just not going too much about it. If asked, you can address it, but it, it's not something that you want to lead with. Again, unless that's the industry that you're in, like if you're a minister or something like that. So, uh, it was a painful time because I, I really wanted the job and I thought it would be a, a good fit. But, you know, as I got older, I thought, well, would that be a place I'd want to work anyway? Yeah. And, and I'm not the only one that's encountered that in, in my life as far as um, fit goes. And I guess, you know, looking back, I, I guess I was kind of glad it came up when it did because at some point it was going to come up anyway. Mm -hmm. And at least at this point I knew going in, so, uh, yeah, some things to, to, to keep in mind, but that was one of those times in life that you look back and you remember, and it was um, yeah, something that, that helped shape how you see things today. You mean, what, 30 years, 30, almost 30 years later, 30 years, holy cow. Hey, listen, we got a couple minutes left. Leslie, anything else you want to throw in there? Anything? So your book's coming out when? Spring 2021. All right. And they can find the core. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. We'll turn the page to a new year. Can we do that now? I'm just wondering. Yeah. Let's fast forward to Christmas time or the holiday time. Yeah, it's sacrilegious, Randy. We can't do it that. Will can't. It will probably be spring is what it looks like. 
Mm -hmm. um, and I do have a website. It's lesliespees.com. That's where I have my blog. And there'll be information closer to that time coming out. And also have a hot mess to message Facebook page. Cool. And so they let me um, remind all of our uh, folks on here, if you know of a topic, a conversation, an idea that you think would be beneficial to share with others, uh, find Randy or I. If you can't find us, again, you don't have internet access. Um, send us an email, send us a LinkedIn right. message, a Facebook message. I can, you can hit me up on Twitter and Instagram, Snapchat, and Tinder. And No, not Tinder. And, um, you know, let us know what your ideas are. We're always, we've got some new ideas that are coming up. We've got, uh, you know, uh, fabulous guest speakers booked out, I think, almost through October now. Yeah, I think you're right. At least halfway through October. So, so we're actually trying to get our act in here. And I think we're doing a, a fairly decent job, Teddy. So I think we are, Randy. I feel good about it. Here, watch this. Yep. I'm patting myself on the back. Awesome. Can we pat you on the back too? You're amazing here. here. Bam, bam, bam. Thanks, buddy. <laughs> so, all right, folks. It's 1259. It's Wednesday. It Thanks a lot for showing up. Leslie, again, my friend, thank you for coming. Thanks for having uh, me. We will see everybody else in a week. All right. Have a great week. Thank you.